This is not a session about Texas Toast. This is about uh, monitoring the de uh, Docker developer lifecycle. Uh, my name is Matt Williams. I'm an evangelist at Datadog. Uh, Datadog, we're a SaaS-based infrastructure monitoring and uh, application performance monitoring tool set. And when you think about infrastructure monitoring, you're probably not thinking developer, at least most people don't think about developers. And maybe people think about the operations side of, uh, of the business because they're the ones that are responsible for you know, making sure all of your machines are, are working well, all the containers are working well, everything's going good. And so they're focused on, they're you know, looking at a, a monitoring platform, making sure everything is all healthy. But it's super important for the developers as well to focus on, monitor, to have some sort of monitoring platform gathering metrics about everything you're doing. And it's really important to start looking at monitoring all the way from the beginning. You know, as soon as you, you know, scaffold up that application, as soon as you have that first decision about using, I don't know, Redis or, or Postgres or whatever backend you're using, as soon as you have your first decisions, it's important to have some sort of monitoring platform in place. And so this session is all about that. Oh, here, there's the, So my name again is Matt Williams. I'm an evangelist at Datadog. Okay, I already said that. If you have any questions, you can reach me at mattw at datadoghq.com or on Twitter, um, technoevangelist. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, let's get started. So this session is about monitoring. This is not a session about creating a great developer environment on Docker, about building a developer environment on Docker. There's probably other sessions here at DockerCon that focus on that kind of thing, about building a, you know, an environment for the Python developer or the Go developer or the Node developer. This is not that session. There's a lot of videos on that, a lot of articles online about that. So this is just about monitoring. What's exciting about monitoring? What's, why should the developer get interested in monitoring? That's what this session's about. You can't improve what you don't measure. You gotta be measuring, you gotta be uh, seeing. The, the code that I worked on today, did it actually improve things or did I go in the wrong direction? Uh, it would kind of suck if you waited, you know, you did maybe a profile one day and then you did a bunch of stuff for the next week and then you looked again and thought, oh my God, it's now 100% slower. Uh, what's going on? When did things get slow? What did I screw up on? Um, and if you're not monitoring all the time, it's really hard to figure out exactly what change you made made things screw up. Collecting data is cheap. Collect as much as you can, collect everything. Everything that's going on about the, the Docker environment, about the host machine, about your application, about the infrastructure, collect everything, collect everything that you can. Because not having it when you need it, potentially could be expensive. Trying to recreate, trying to go back in time, trying to figure out what you made changes to that, that screwed things up, that's gonna be really difficult. And trying to recreate and trying to figure out, you know, if you're in operations and you're trying to recreate a, a, a major outage, that's gonna suck. Um, so, you know, you gotta collect everything you can because not having it when you need it can be expensive. So you collect everything, collect everything. Everything from every, I keep saying that, collect everything. Um, but, Unfortunately, it's not all perfect. If you collect everything, now you've got to deal with everything. And now it's really hard to know what to focus on. What are the metrics that you need to focus on as a developer? Because you know, if you're a developer that is focused on, you know, you're, you're a Python developer, you're a Go developer, Node.js, whatever it is, let's say Python, um, and you know all about using Python. You know about building applications on, in Python, and you know about a framework. You know about using maybe Flask or Pylons or Django or something else. You know about that. And then you know about some libraries for working with Postgres or working with Redis. But just because you know about how to use those libraries doesn't mean you know, understand Postgres itself about Redis. You know, if, if we look at Redis, we've got, we'll collect about, um, I think it's like 50 or 60 metrics every 15 seconds. I don't think, I mean, I definitely don't know what all those metrics mean. And I'm sure most of you, if you're a developer, you probably don't know what they mean either. But it's important to look at just a few metrics. You know, often they, there's a few key metrics that you should look at, but do you even know what they are? So one thing that we've been doing over the last, well, last couple of years now, uh, we've got a team at Datadog totally focused on building great content about 
how to monitor, how to think about monitoring, how to think about uh, monitoring Postgres, how to think about monitoring Redis, how to think about monitoring Docker. Um, we have a, a long series of articles about, about doing this. And one of the first articles was about monitoring 101. How do you think about metrics? What are the metrics that you need to uh, focus on? How do you, if I'm, you know, many of our customers are bringing in 8,000, 10,000, 20,000 metrics every 15 seconds. Which metrics are most important? So in Monitoring 101, we've got, this is supposed to be blank, don't worry. Um, in Monitoring 101, we have a system. It's a system of three buckets. The first bucket is the work metrics. Uh, work metrics are the most important thing. Those are the things you need to focus on. That's where you really need to spend your time looking at to ensure things are going well. Second bucket is resource metrics. Resource metrics are, yeah, you know, they're, they're interesting. They add context, but they're not super important. Another bucket is the events. Again, interesting stuff, but not super important. They don't really tell you anything on their own, but they add context to those work metrics. So what are the work metrics? They are uh, throughput, success, error, and uh, performance. So throughput. Um, if we're dealing with Nginx, it's gonna be number of requests processed per second. Uh, how many uh, requests are coming in every second are being dealt with by Nginx or Apache or whatever your web server happens to be? Um, and then success and errors are, well, what percentage of those result in a 200 response code? Or which percentage of those result in a 404 response code? Those are, those are the key metrics that you need to deal with. And you know, there are work metrics for whatever platform you're dealing with, whether it's Redis or Postgres or whatever it happens to be. Um, so work metrics are where you spend most of your time. That's what you really pay attention to. And everything else just adds context. So the next one is resource metrics is utilization. It is saturation, error, and availability. So utilization. If you open up, you know, probably one of the most common monitoring tools out there is going to be Top or HTOP. And you open up HTOP and you take a look and you'll see, you know, a, a, maybe a little a diagram for each of the cores on your uh, CPU. It tells you CPU utilization. And on its own, that's got to be the single most worthless metric you can possibly look at because it doesn't tell you anything. 2%, 99%, is that good or bad? I guess it kind of depends on the context. Um, but it adds context to throughput and it becomes a lot more interesting. Uh, saturation, uh, commonly more, more commonly known as a queue. You know, how long is that queue uh, of stuff waiting get, to get processed by uh, your infrastructure or by your application that you wrote? There's, there's stuff waiting in a line, how long is that line? And that's saturation. Availability might be, um, how available is the server? How, you know, the server is available, or your application, or your database is available 95% of the time, 99% of the time, whatever that happens to be. Events also add context to those work metrics. Code changes, uh, scaling events, alerts, and more. So code changes could be, uh, you know, you do a GitHub commit. Okay, and maybe uh, uh, Jenkins, as soon as it sees there's a GitHub commit, it does, a, um, does some testing and deploys out. Great stuff to know about, but kind of useless. It doesn't really tell you if anything bad is happening. Um, but you, have a, you do a GitHub commit. Jenkins sees that and does some stuff. It deploys it to maybe it's to staging. And then all of a sudden you see utilization go from 2% to a 99% right after that change. That's interesting. Uh, and then throughput goes from a million requests per second down to two. Well, that tells me a complete story. That tells me something, oh, something's really bad. I've, I've just done something that really screwed things up. I better go try and fix it. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe utilization goes from 99% um, down to two, so it's hardly doing anything, and request per second goes from uh, 100 to 10,000. And as amazing as a developer you are, as you are, Maybe your system, you know your system cannot possibly handle that many uh, responses in, in a second. So you know something's wrong. I gotta take a drink of my Texas water. Hold on. So much better than regular water. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, so, um, and then we focus on the work metrics. That's the most important thing. Focus on the work metrics. Everything else just adds value, adds, you know, it lets you figure out what's going on. Cool. But it's important to not just 
you know, you might go through, figure out what are the work metrics, and there's a long list of work metrics um, that for, for each type of thing that you're, you're focused on. But it's important not just to look at the whole list and you know, make everything better, but you've got your work metrics, or you've got your metrics and your overall uh, business goals. And it's important to keep both in mind and really only focus on the metrics that help support your business goals. If you have, maybe there's, let's say there's 10 uh, work metrics for whatever thing that you're looking at, and you spend two days optimizing your code to show you know, a much better number for one particular metric, but it has nothing to do with your business goals. Now, is that a waste of time? Maybe. Maybe you could have spent more of your time working on things that really help to meet your business goals. Your manager will definitely like it, and your executive team will definitely like it if you do that and make your customers happy. So let's imagine that I have a, an application I've been writing, and that application um, uses a bunch of containers on Docker. Let's say that I've got um, uh, one container that's my website, and maybe that's a Python-based application that's using um, uh, a Flask. And then maybe I've got uh, kind of in the back end, I've got some back end workers, it's using Celery, um, and so I've got a separate container just doing that Celery process. And then I've got, uh, um, I've got you know, a kind of temporary storage used by Celery, which might be in Redis. And I want to have longer term storage for my application in Postgres. So I've got a dedicated container for Postgres. Because usually we want to try to have you know, maybe one process per container. Although I sometimes abuse that too. But you know, I try to have one process per container. And so now I've got, um, you know, I've got four containers here. And now I want to start monitoring it. Now, I am doing what I said I shouldn't do. I should be monitoring right from the beginning. So I should have probably set up a monitoring uh, container right at the beginning, but I'm coming to it a bit late. I've got my four containers. I've already got some stuff going on, and I want to start monitoring. So um, let's say that I'm using Docker Compose, and I want to add monitoring to my Docker environment. Basically, here's all I have to do. I have to add a doc Datadog container. Well, let's assume that you're using Datadog. Okay, um, so if you're using Datadog, um, you're gonna add one container to your uh, Docker Compose file. And I, so I'm, I'm in Docker Compose, I've got services, and then a bunch of these uh, services, Redis, Postgres, and a bunch of thing, other things, and I've added another one called Datadog. Doesn't matter what you call it, but I'll call it Datadog. Um, and it's coming based on an image that's on Docker Hub, it's a Datadog slash Docker DD agent, and then we've got, uh, we mount up a bunch of volumes, really just giving us access to C groups and proc and a bunch of other things. Um, but what's really important there is that fourth line. Um, I'm mounting, uh, I run Docker Compose, and in that Docker Compose, wherever Docker Compose YAML is, there's a Datadog subdirectory. I can call it whatever I want. And then there's a conf.d directory. Seemed like a nice name for a directory. Um, and that I'm going to mount as slash conf.d in my uh, uh, Datadog uh, Docker container. And what that's going to do is copy a bunch of uh, whatever uh, files are in that directory, copy them up to that conf.d uh, directory on the container. And then I've added a bunch of environment variables like API key. Um, if, by the way, if you see somebody post an API key from Datadog and it has the word bogus key, it's not a real key, so FYI, I, I, I know. Um, that's bogus. Um, I didn't want you to take my account. Uh, that would be, I think somebody might be sneaky enough to do that. Um, then there's a host name, and then there's tags. Tags are super important. Last thing you want to do is create a bunch of dashboards specific to whatever host name or container name or whatever. You want to work with tags. Tags are super cool because I can, uh, let's say I've got, um, you know, I've got my, my, my uh, development environment. I've got a fl uh, Flask and Junicorn uh, server uh, that's running on, in a container, but let's say I'm scaling it out. And so I've given um, each of my um, uh, Junicorn, or maybe I'm using Apache or something else, Nginx, I've given each of those web servers a tag. I've assigned a tag. Um, and uh, so I've assigned a tag, and now I create a dashboard that looks at that tag. Um, now, if I've got one machine, that's pretty easy. I'm not having to do a lot of aggregation, but now it's time to start scaling out, verifying that scaling out really works, and I scale up to a thousand different containers. Well, I don't have to modify that dashboard at all because I'm just looking at role web uh, for uh, all the machines in there, and I aggregate all the machines, and we just do that automatically. So that's pretty cool. So as soon as we do that, we get a bunch of metrics. As soon as I add that Docker container. 
Now, work metrics doesn't really apply to Docker because it's, it's kind of a resource for uh, my other stuff that's running on top of Docker. So I got a bunch of resource metrics, system, uh, uh, CPU stuff and uh, memory from uh, Docker, uh, resident set size and uh, network stuff. Um, but uh, maybe I want to start monitoring Redis. And so what I have to do for Redis is, you know, in my Docker Compose, just add a links and mention Redis, which is one of the other services that's in my Docker Compose file. And in the data.conf.d directory, add a redis.yaml file. And that redis.yaml file is just going to um, point to that host, Redis, which is in my links, um, and uh, um, port 6379, because that's probably what it's being uh, exposed as. And uh, maybe my password is dev password. Um, so as soon as I do that, I get a bunch of metrics. Now this isn't the whole set of metrics because there'd be like 50 and that would kind of suck to look at a slide with 50 things on it. So there's six here. Uh, latency based on the Redis info command, uh, how many clients are connecting, how many are blocked, and the resource metrics, uh, fragmentation ratio, that's pretty uh, important one to look at, um, memory used and keys evicted. So, you know, Redis is an in-memory database. As you add more stuff to it, uh, you know, maybe you, you use up all the space and keys start getting evicted. Maybe that was intentional, but maybe it's not. And that's something useful to know. But the fact that keys got evicted, not really interesting, not really important, but it adds context to uh, maybe latency or the clients that are connected. Okay, cool. So now I've, and maybe let's, uh, uh, let's say that I've done all this for Redis and for Postgres and for the base operating system as well. Now it's time to start instrumenting my application. And so um, all I have to do, if I've got a Python-based application that's using Flask, all I have to do is add a few imports, you know, DD Trace and Blinker, and uh, use my trace middleware, because the trace middleware knows about Flask, and so it already knows a lot of, it's already figured out a lot of information about my application. It figured out um, uh, all the different queue or routes that are coming, going through. Okay, in this example, there's only one route, but let's pretend it's a much more complicated system. So it figures all that stuff out and we get a uh, screen that looks like this. And right away I can see hits per second, I can see latency and latency distribution. I can see that 90% of all my requests that are coming in for this particular uh, uh, service are being dealt with within 60 milliseconds or 55 milliseconds. So that's pretty cool. And if I scroll down, I'll see all the different uh, queries that are being dealt with by this particular service. Now, if I go ahead and click on one of those, I'm going to see a screen that looks like this. You might think, hey, that's the same screen. But it's a little bit different. This is um, for that particular query, um, we have sampled a bunch of, a bunch of the um, queries coming in. So we don't look at everything because that would put a lot of undue stress on your system. We wanna to try to be pretty minimal, minimal overhead. Uh, but if I scroll down, I see the actual samples that have been collected. Um, and if I click on one of those, I get a flame graph. This is a boring flame graph. This doesn't have a lot of detail in it because all I've added are those four lines of code, four or five lines of code. To get more detail, I need to go through all my code and start instrumenting the rest of the functions. So instrumenting the rest of the functions basically for Python is gonna look like something like this, where we uh, add a decorator on the top. We know generally how things work, but as soon as we do the uh, um, cursor execute, we're gonna get a little bit more detail about what exactly is happening for this part of the query. And when we, once we do that and we go through all of our code and instrument it, we're gonna get a much more detailed flame graph where we can see all the detail of what's really happening in my environment. So I see the pylons request at the top and all the different pieces that are involved with my pylons request. Super cool, but now you're thinking, oh my God, now I've got like three screens to look at, four screens to look at, I gotta look at Postgres, I gotta look at Redis, I gotta look at my application. How do I have time to do all this stuff? Well, one thing that we uh, want really made, we think is really important is you should be able to create whatever dashboards you want. And those dashboards should have all the information that you care about. So here's a sample dashboard where we have uh, the APM stuff, you know, the latency distribution, along with my key metrics from Postgres and Redis. Okay, Redis keys evicted is zero. That's a pretty boring example. But then I've got my samples for this particular query. And below that, my load uh, on my different hosts compared for today compared to yesterday. And maybe I go into my application and uh, say every time this thing increments, go ahead and record that to Datadog as well. So I've got that as well. Ooh, it's looks like I'm over time. And that's convenient because 
Here's my last slide. My name is Matt Williams. I'm an evangelist at Datadog. You can reach me on those uh, methods. Um, and I'm out of time, so we're going to move on to the next guy. Thanks so much. We've got a booth here, and we are giving away a Nintendo Switch at 3.30. So when I am done, when this thing is done, go over there, uh, put in that thing, and uh, we might give you a Nintendo Switch. That's awesome. Okay, bye. All right. We have audio. We have audio. All right. Welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Madsen. Uh, I'm a principal tech marketing engineer at Nimble Storage. Uh, I'm going to talk about advanced data services for Docker. Uh, I'm going to kind of do a bit of some, some demos, and um, uh, it's not all going to be PowerPoint. Let me just get my clicker working here. There we go. So this is briefly what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about Nimble's Docker integration, uh, the Nimble specific cap capabilities that we bring to this ecosystem, uh, and talk a little bit about our, about our use cases. The demo is going to do some Docker volume intro things, and I'm going to go deeper into how we uh, integrate with Docker volumes. Uh, doing a, a bit of a simple demo on how to use Docker Compose to clone Docker volumes as a unique feature that we bring to Docker. Uh, and also for the lift and shift use case, um, I'm going to import a non-Docker volume uh, from a virtual machine into Docker using our uh, Docker volume plugin. <clears throat> so storage and volumes, uh, is that the same thing? Uh, no, it's not. So. Docker storage, that's basically where you store all your runtime information about Docker. On a Linux box that is mounted on slash var lib Docker, it just needs to be fast and reliable and space efficient. Uh, your Docker volumes, they need to be secure and protect, protected, stateful, portable. And usually you want them with premium features, such as being able to back them up and do snapshots, being able to clone them and so forth. And that is your, where you basically store your valuable data. <clears throat> So the integration pretty much looks like this. Um, on, a, on a given Docker host, uh, we can provide storage for Varlib Docker and also the volumes that are mounted under slash opt nimble vol with our Docker volume plugin. And those are basically volumes served off a nimble storage array of any flavors. We, we have a, a, a broad family of different array models you can choose from depending on your performance characteristics and so forth. And and another important aspect is, or wow, it's just all came out there. We have a plugin for Linux. Uh, we have a plugin for Windows. Uh, the Linux one you can find in the Docker store. It's uh, certified by Docker. And as of this morning, uh, we are the single only storage vendor that can provide a unified storage solution for Docker Swarm in hybrid mode. Uh, so if you look, if you saw the keynote this morning uh, that we're demoing running Windows and Linux um, in the same Swarm. And since our plugin works the same both for Windows and Linux, we can provide storage for that type of solution. <clears throat> uh, looking a little bit on uh, the capabilities that we bring to Docker, uh, look at the data services. It, we have a really advanced data plane, uh, allows you to do quality of service uh, and limits, define performance policies, use zero copy cloning facilities, it's ultra low latency, sub millisecond latency. We have a measured uptime about six, six nines availability, availability across uh, our install base. Uh, data needs to be protected and secure. Uh, we support data at rest encryption. That is something that you can toggle from the Docker interface itself. You can assign uh, something called protection template to be able to back up and replicate your uh, volumes. And we also have snapshot fa facilities and so forth. <clears throat> Uh, from a data reduction standpoint, uh, we have a number of uh, industry-leading features, uh, uh, variable block compression and deduplication, zero pattern el elimination, and so forth, and also thin provisioning that has been around in the storage industry for the last 30 years or so. <clears throat> all this you can kind of, we, we send metrics about all, all our arrays up to a, a cloud service that we provide called InfoSight, uh, where we run predictive analytics on all your storage system that you have from Nimble. Uh, we also go up the stack for certain applications, such as VMware, to kind of provide more um, application-specific monitoring as well. <clears throat> so let's see here. So demos. I'm going to tell, tell you that I've done my sacrifices. I don't have a bullhorn here. And I'm not going to say anything strange or do any weird gestures, but uh, I have a number of failed de demos under my belt, so hopefully these won't be <laughs> failed. 
Um, so I'm just going to go through this real quick on a, in PowerPoint mode, uh, like the Docker volume intro, right? You do Docker volume create foo, that will create a foo volume that you can mount inside a container. Uh, how you use our driver is basically you specify dash D nimble, and that will create the, the volume bar, and you can mount that inside a container exactly how you would mount a local container, a, a local volume. So our value add kind of comes into, we kind of overloaded the, um, the option uh, key value that you can, key value pairs that you can pass into the, the driver itself. Uh, and that's where we bring all the capabilities to Docker. And uh, we have that help output. Um, if you do a dash D nimble dash O help, and I will now show that how the, all these things work. Oh, that's not good. I'm disconnected. That's never good. I'm just going to log in everywhere here again. All right, there we go. So you can't see that, no? Let's do that a bit bigger. Uh, and that was too big. Let's go back. Is that just right? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so you simply, this is the help screen, or more or less like the error message you get when you do dash O help, right? And that shows you all the different options that we provide uh, that use as a Docker user can leverage from the array itself. <clears throat> so if you want to create a volume, Simply give it a name. Uh, why does it do in this? All right, so I probably lost connection to my filer. This is what I'm telling you about failed demos. Um, let me just try to fix this real quick. Uh, I will simply pop that back. I don't have time to fill with this, so I will just continue. Uh, sorry about that. So I will go in uh, a bit deeper in the uh, different use cases. Um, CI/CD is something that is really um, that's really important use case for for Docker. Uh, I'm also going to talk about lift and shift. And container as a service is something that uh, we hear more and more. And uh, we have a, a bunch of different uh, capabilities of the array itself that will allow you as a service provider leverage the storage features that we have. <clears throat> so imagine you would have a, um, um, a user somewhere. Uh, it has a container. You have a prod container using a prod volume being served off a nimble array. Uh, oops, wrong way. Uh, somebody does a git push, and you build the infrastructure, will essentially um, build a container in a dev, test, and QA, and lab environment. And we'll shift that to a central registry. Oops. Why is it doing that to me? <clears throat> Sorry about that. So when you, when you get to the stage where you want to run, run your tests on your, on your volume, you can essentially, essentially just do the Docker volume create either from a compose file or something similar. And that will essentially clone your production volume into a test environment. And the operation you would do, use to do that, you would simply do dash O, clone off, and the production volume name. And <clears throat> moving over to stage, uh, you would simply destroy whatever you had in your dev environment. Uh, the volume you can, would, you can configure to, all, to persist on the array as it is. And then you can do a volume, destroy whatever you have in the staging environment, uh, and basically import that volume into the stage environment by using the which volume you want to import and, what, and, and give it a name and so forth. <clears throat> and once, that, once you get to production, all you do is you basically update the container and uh, run your test and job done. And this will kind of increase your confidence in your tests because you basically used production data when you ran your tests in your, in your CI CD workflow, right? So you don't have to work with database stubs. You don't have to generate dummy data. You don't have to work with data that is 10, 10 years old, whatever, right? So you just have an instant copy of your production volume available for your test and staging environments where you can run tests that don't, doesn't affect production. <clears throat> and let me see if, uh, let me just see if uh, this works.
Du, du, du. Let me just create a volume from my Windows machine here real quick and see if that works. I think my virtual array... went under. Yeah, I've had some troubles with my dev environment and it's been running quite hot the <laughs> last few days. <clears throat> and this is the plugin running on Windows. Um, and it takes some time with these two. So it basically does here, yeah, it seems to work. So what it actually does here is it com communicates with the array over the, re over the REST API, creates a volume on the array, formats a file system, in this case NTFS, and uh, presents the volume to the host and so forth. So <clears throat> I'm just gonna show real quick here, if I do a Docker compose, why is it doing that? Docker compose config, right? So here I have a pretty standard Minio. Uh, Minio is a S3 compatible object storage server. I'm gonna bring that up real quick. <clears throat> so what happens here is, you see here in, 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 your, in your volume section, you specify the driver nimble and the driver options. It's the same options that you have in the help output. It creates the volume dev export with a nimble driver and then creates the container. And what I'm gonna do here real quick, I'm just gonna upload some trash data here so just you see how the, these things work. Uh, by default, uh, Minio listens on port 9000. Hopefully it does that today, it does, excellent. Nimble, one, two, three. Uh, so I created a fairly small volume just to be able to format it quite fast. I have an eight gig volume mounted here. Um, I'm gonna upload a file. I'm just gonna upload a, a YAML file here. Oh, I need a bucket. I need a bucket. Where's my bucket? Bucket. There we go. Upload a menu file. Now I have a 400 circa bytes file in this um, particular instance. So I'm gonna step back to my Windows machine where I have uh, this menu instance running. I'm gonna go into another directory where I have another Docker Compose file. I'm just gonna show you real quick what, what was in that. So what I'm gonna specify here is simply, the file looks fairly sim similar to the the, the, the one I showed you previously, the only difference is in the volume section where you specify clone off. And the clone off is the Docker volume name that you want to create a clone of, right? So if I would do a Docker volume ls here, that's my volume that is running currently. So I would do a Docker compose up here. Uh, it will basically create a zero copy clone of that volume uh, and will start the container. Uh, and this particular instance, I'm gonna run on port 9001, right? So I can go back to my web browser here. Uh, and I have a cloned instance of Minio running here. There's my Minio YAML file. Uh, and this is a zero copy clone, and, and this is completely unaffected whatever the production is doing. So I'm gonna delete, delete this file from the test instance. And I can go back to the prod instance and the file is still there. So that's basically how you use clones in, in the sense that you will clone data into test environments and so forth for, for in integrating into your CI CD uh, workloads. Yeah, so this is just the basics here. I'm happy my Windows box worked. Uh, so lift and shift, um, importing data from legacy environments. Um, oops, that animated real quick. Um, let me step back here. So just imagine you have infrastructure sitting today on uh, VMware, vSphere, OpenStack, you're using Cinder. You have um, volume sitting on bare metal mounted to your application servers. You don't wanna copy any data around. You just wanna be able to migrate that data into Docker. And we have the capability, as long as the volume sits on a nimble array, being able to import that into a Docker volume, right? And we just specify the import vol and what the actual nimble volume on the array is called. And uh, we will be able to mount that inside a container. Uh, we also have the ability to import a volume as a clone so you don't actually have to cut over the data into the container if you don't have to. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to show you real quick uh, on how how you can lift and shift our MySQL database. Uh, I'm just going to see in time here. Oh wow! Uh, in, and I would basically import the volume as a clone, uh, and that's the, the, the driver option I would specify. And this is how you would kind of test cycle this. You do a Docker compose up and do a do Docker compose down and dash V. That would destroy the volume. Um, and there's also the option of doing the import volume directly to cut it over. So I'm just going to show you how this works. Hopefully this guy works. So here I have a MySQL database running. Uh, it's running on a virtual machine. Uh, we have a utility to list your volumes here. So this is basically a device. Um, the volume is called MySQL DX. Uh, it's mounted uh, from uh, slash dev nimble storage. Uh, it's a multi-path device, right? And if you look at mount, uh, grep, oh, grep MySQL. You can see that that volume is actually mounted on slash var lib MySQL. And so I'm going to do a, I'm going to populate, uh, so I have a, I'm going to create a new database and just put some junk in it. Um, and just put in a random number in there so you can see that this is not the smoke and mirrors. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I think that was nimble. Yes. There we go. Uh, we set it, I put in a random value and a DockerCon. So to be able to import this volume as a clone to my actual container, I need to do a snapshot of the volume, right? There are many ways to facilitate a snapshot on a volume. Uh, usually you have an application consistent uh, snapshot, uh, especially on a database. But I'm, I'm just going to log in here to the web UI. Um, and find my volume. Here it is, MySQL D. Click that. I'm going to take a snapshot. I'm going to call that DockerCon. And now I have a snapshot of that volume that is a application consistent, not a crash consistent snapshot. And here I'm on my Docker host. Uh, it doesn't have any volumes, uh, shouldn't have any volumes. Um, and if I go down to my Vagrant MySQL D, I have a Docker Compose file here um, that essentially, oh, the text was really small, uh, but it basically spec specifies import volume as a clone, and I'll specify the volume name. I'll run that in the background. So it creates the, the, the Docker Compose uh, resources like a network, uh, and it, it, it creates the clone of that volume, and we should now be up and running with. Uh, do a Docker PS. I have my SQL running. Uh, so let me just do a Docker exec in, into this container. Um, I'm going to run this interactively for now. Uh, and I can do a MySQL user root, password nimble. I want to use my test DB. There we go. Right. And I can do a select from KV store. Oh, from, yeah, all right, so sorry about that. There we go, and essentially, I've now imported a, a regular volume that I had mapped to a virtual machine into a Docker container, and it, it's essentially, as, as Docker sees it, that imported clone is now a fully featured Docker volume that you can do whatever you want with. And that is a very powerful feature. Uh, container as a service, uh, I'm going to rush through this real quick. Sorry, I'm running late. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, what we call essential multi-tenancy features for providers. So if you're looking at hosting a Docker data center for uh, either Pepsi or Coca-Cola, you can do so with an array from Nimble Storage by using our multi-tenancy feature. So, if we go with, we have a nimble array somewhere, it has a pool, we have a pool construct on the array itself that, that you will essentially name this pool tenants. Uh, you have a budget on that pool, right? You know that you have 120,000 IOPS, you have a gig of throughput, and you have 100 terabytes of capacity, right? And you want to be able to household that, right? So you basically create something we call a folder, and you uh, allocate uh, storage resources to that folder, and all the 
and in, and in turn you can you can have multiple tenants in, in separate folders and have have separate characteristics on those folders. But what you do is your Docker engines that you kind of connect to this particular tenant uh, will basically be sitting in. So this is in the provider control domain. So you will have an override file for the Docker volume driver that we have, right? That tells you that you want to create all the volumes in the tenant's pool, and it's going to be forced to be created in the Mobi folder. <clears throat> and the interface that your user will have access to is the uni Docker universal control plane. And the awesome thing here as well is that T-Mobi, they can, they can specify their own, they can, they can household with the performance that they have, right? So if they know that T-Mobi that has 15,000 IOPS, they can then govern their own performance within their own limits on the volumes that they create by specify, specifying the, the IOPS or the throughput limits and the capacity for that matter as well. Um, so I'm gonna walk through that real quick. Uh, I have a Docker UCP demo uh, with the Docker data center. Uh, this is a real quick one. I just wanna show you how this works. Uh, so this is the uh, universal control plane UI. Uh, I'm gonna deploy a stack here. Oh, got timed out. Mobi. Secret password. So I'm gonna deploy a new stack here. Um, I'm gonna import Docker Compose file. It's gonna be a menu as well. Uh, there's nothing in particular interesting there. I'm just gonna create a, a, a small volume. Uh, and the cool thing I'm gonna show you is how you actually set these limits as if you were a service provider. So I'm gonna go back into our web UI and I'm gonna turn on we have pretty basic monitoring on the array itself. I'm gonna select my Mobi folder here, uh, and, I, and I'm gonna keep, keep an eye on throughput down here because that's how I'm gonna throttle it. Um, so I'm just gonna step back here to data storage as well. Um, let's go back to universal control plane. The app should be up and running. Uh, I'm just gonna Snag that IP address, port 9000. I'm gonna log in. So this is a fresh empty instance. I'm gonna first create a bucket this time. DockerCon. And I'm gonna upload a file. So I have a, a JDK here. This is a 280 meg file. And I'm simply gonna upload that without any performance governors on it, right? And if I go back to my, my UI here, if I turn on real-time monitoring, we actually see something. You can see that that, that file just flew through, right, in, in basically 50 megs per second on my laptop here. So I'm running a virtual array on my laptop. This is not representable, representable performance in that act. Uh, so what I can do then, go back to my other tab here, uh, which I can, in Mobi, I can find my volume here. So my app-export was the volume that I was creating with my Docker Compose file. So if I, <clears throat> now I want to change the folder, oh, back, back. So on the folder itself here, I click folders, I have, I have folder selected. Yeah, folder actions, here we go. Edit, right. So in this folder, you can simply set the usage limits. That's how, how much space you can consume as a tenant. And this is also how many IOPS or throughput that you can household with for that particular tenant. So I'm going to set a minimum of eight megs per second. Uh, and now that performance uh, governor has been set on that particular folder, uh, and I'm gonna go over to my real-time performance monitoring here, and I should be able to see when I upload a new file in Minio. So I'm just gonna delete the old file. Upload a new one. And you can see that the buffers fills up quite quickly on the, on the, on the UI in the, in the client here. But if I go over to the array here, we can see that it's capped at eight megs per second. And you can also see that the UI now detected that there was a limit set there, so you will have a red line sitting uh, where you basically cap the performance at eight megs. So that's it's basically how you would do it as a service provider if you wanna be able to provide this as a service 
for multiple environments. And uh, thank you, that was all I had. Uh, please visit our booth. Uh, we have a Google Home that we're gonna raffle in, uh, in a half an hour or something like that, I think. Uh, and um, uh, I'll be around here if you have questions. If you have questions for the general audience, please feel free to shoot them out. Someone's raising their hands. Yeah, I can't really see it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you said that it was crashed into the system. Was that just because it was an idle MySAM engine, or was there something fancier going on? No, I mean, it's, it's just crash consistent in, in that way, because if you want to snapshot a database, you need to have it in a consistent state, right? And basically, I, I was just snapshotting an idle My, MySQL instance, right? And that's what I call crash consistence, because we're running XFS on the, on the bottom, right? So it will be able to detect that it has some dirty buffers, will be able to replay it and be able to mount it, right? Uh, but it won't have up to last transaction type semantics because that you need uh, a properly orchestrated uh, app consistent backup for or snapshot. And we, and we can provide th tools to do that. Yeah, all right, cool. Any other questions? Yeah, if you want to see, see a demo on, on how, how cloning works for SQL Server, uh, we have a demo in our booth to, to show, it, show that off. So, all right, thank you.